Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're going to go back in the slides here to the very first one. That's the theory, anyway. All right, here we go. There we go. There's the main, main slide there. Uh, welcome to this very interesting platform. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you're able to figure out kind of how it works. Uh, apparently, I, you can press various keys. Hello, there's a high. Uh, probably my favorite key is this one. Bet you didn't know you could do that. Um, <laughs> okay. When you do it live. Yes, it's much better when you do it live, yeah. Uh, good stuff. Okay, uh, the way we'll work um, with uh, with questions and things like that, there's a little raise hand button, or should be, uh, down at the bottom. You raise a hand, and then I say your name, and they will release your microphone. That's the first way we can do this. Uh, but the other way is that you can just use the chat here in the public down at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. For those of you that are speakers, you're able to turn on your mics, uh, but they ask you not to do that. Uh, so if you, if you would, uh, don't mind, and we'll we'll see how this works. So this is my first experience with this platform, which is good, um, and it's good to see you all in here. We'll start here in about eight minutes, uh, but we'll banter a little bit uh, and go from there. It looks like the screen is okay. Yeah, it looks all right. Not too bad. There's seats up on stage. I think it'd be weird if I went and sat down. Uh, it is good to uh, see uh, some of you in here. A lot of you I know. Hugo, always good to see you. Ben, of course. Congratulations again, Ben, on your recent act of procreation. And uh, Ben is now joining us on stage for some apparent reason. And now he's walking back and trying to figure out where he's going to sit. See everything. I'm not sure why Ben's going to sit on the stage, but there we go. Apparently, we're not supposed to do that either, so I figured that's what I'm no. going to do. Yeah. <laughs> no, Always you're not the attention to... seeker. Yeah, Always. that's right. That's right. I don't know how to sit down, although, you know, it's an avatar, so I don't think you actually get tired or anything. Um, and we've got some other folks in here. Um, I am a native English speaker. I'm an American, which means I'm not bilingual or trilingual. I'm uh, unilingual. I only speak English, and I don't do that exceptionally well. Uh, but we will go as slow as possible uh, with the words to make sure that we are clear. If for some reason you um, have a you don't understand something I say, or if you want me to repeat something. Uh, just as I mentioned, just go ahead and push that uh, down in the public chat window, and I'll watch that carefully. I am, uh, I've taught at college for years, and so I'm used to using the little chat feature there. It's uh, 9.30 in the morning here in Florida, which is where I'm at, and depending on where you're uh, coming from there. And let's see, there's some beeps happening, and I'm not sure why. I guess it's just people coming in. So that's good. <laughs> it is good to see everyone. I wish we could be together. I've not been to Poland, and I would actually like to go. Uh, so that's one one of the places I'd like to go. I also want to do um, uh, I want to do Singapore. I've not done Singapore before, um, so I'd really like to do that someday. Uh, the issue is that Singapore is violently expensive. Uh, to go to, and it's fairly limited in space uh, for conferences and so on. So they usually have them in Australia or India or China, you know, for Asia, for Microsoft. Uh, we usually do it sort of that way. We are in good shape. And uh, got folks in the room there. Good stuff. And uh, if you uh, would like to see the screen a little better, there, there's a button down next to the chat window on the left, down at the bottom, that says Stage Zoom. And you'll probably want to do that. We'll, we'll stay um, in slide world mostly today. Uh, so you'll be able to, to sort of do that. Oops. I have left the stage. I'm, I'm still getting used to this, so... I'm not a PC gamer. Uh, back when I was younger, Asteroids and Pong were the major games. And I do play chess on the computer, but those are the only games I play. I'm, 
not really much of a gamer. My son-in-law is. Gather and have shoot 'em ups. Uh, apparently, that's what you do. What was I trying to click on before I left the stage? Oh, I was trying to see everybody in the room. Wonderful. Now, the other reason that I'm going to have you use the chat feature more so than the voice is that when you uh, do the when you ask a question or you raise your hand, I have to say your name, and then the room moderator will let you speak. Um, I would not be able to say a lot of these names correctly, so I would uh, I would mess up, and I don't want to do that. I, I think it's important to get people's names right. Okay, we have about four minutes before we get started. Normally, I've got some music playing in the background, that sort of thing. Uh, not happening today, obviously. I guess I could uh, turn some music on here, but uh, be kind of uh, redundant. So we've got some folks coming in. Again, yeah. the stage zoom is what you want to do. And if you do, uh, if you are able to use your microphone for your speaker, go ahead and cut that uh, to mute if you don't mind during this so we don't pick up the dogs barking and Ben sobbing gently into his um, screen in the background. If you get a chance, definitely go here. Hugo, um, are you speaking today? Can you put it in the chat window if you're speaking today? And Ben, I think you are speaking as well. If you want to tell us the time and room number, uh, that'd be great. As a matter of fact, if there are any. Oh, you spoke at 1210 local time. You go, where are you located? Where do you live? Ah, and Lewis has just finished his. Okay, good. The Netherlands. Ah, yes. Right after you, Ben. Oh, Azure Arc enabled data services. I hear good things about that, Hassan. Spoke at 8 this morning. Awesome. So we've got a lot of good speakers in here. That's wonderful. Um, those of you who speak and those of you who want to do speaking, always a good thing there. I think the little ding is when somebody teleports into the room. I'm hearing a little ding in the background. I don't know if you guys also hear that, but I'm hearing a little ding in the background. When people teleport in, I'm watching the room. Awesome. Hugo is typing. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, at, at our church, the uh, bathroom to go to the restroom is at the front of the church. Uh, so you have to get up and walk past everyone. It's a fairly large building uh, to go to the bathroom. And so people just hold it. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, of the walk okay we're just about a minute away and we're going to do this now uh, just so you know uh, i will be giving out the materials uh, in fact this entire session is based on a workshop that i give that takes all day and uh, normally i have you come in and you give a little five minute presentation then we work through various exercises and at the end of the day you give that same presentation again and the class judges whether you've gotten better or not. Each person does that. So it's obviously an entire day of things to do. Uh, so we've got um, a, a full workshop. And I will give you the links to that workshop. And if you would like to re-deliver uh, this information, I'm completely okay with that. I know a lot of people uh, get a little nervous about giving out their materials. Uh, I think that everyone should be smarter, so I don't mind a, a bit. So for those of you who have just come in, we're right at 930, and I want to be very prompt on our time and make sure that I honor the fact that you are here on time. And uh, you're in the session called Presentation Skills for the Technical Professional, which is going to be a little, a little different. Now, uh, I, I've mentioned before that one of the things you should do is set some ground rules when you first uh, come in. Uh, that you've probably seen the instructions to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. If you just go ahead and type in the chat window, I'll keep that uh, front and center, and uh, I'll answer those um, in order. And if I see one that I'm going to answer later, I'll still acknowledge it and say, I see your question there, and we're going to cover that in a minute. So uh, don't be afraid uh, to type that. And I may say that again 
because we'll have people uh, join as they try to figure out <laughs> the platform as we go forward. So my name is Buck Woody, and I live in Florida in the United States of America, and I work for Microsoft. And I've been uh, speaking and teaching people to speak for many, many, many years. My avatar shows uh, white hair, but in fact, I'm, I'm much older than that. I don't have a lot of hair. Um, ben and I are in a race to see who can have the perfect uh, shiny dome, and uh, I, I couldn't find a thing. Um, that's fine, Thomas. Uh, that's fine. To voice, if you want to do that, I will uh, call out your name, or I'll do the best I can <laughs> and call out your name, and uh, Thomas will um, uh, will will enable your microphone if you want to do it that way. But again, if you just type into the chat window. Uh, we can avoid any language problems or anything like that. Let's let's go ahead and get started. So if you want to use your stage Zoom button, we'll be pretty much in PowerPoint world today. And we are going to talk about uh, PowerPoint in a little bit. And I'm going to start off by telling you that this particular presentation that we're doing is not a best practice for the presentations that you will do, it's primarily because this presentation is built as a learning deck. And what that means is I'll have a lot of bullet points on here. And normally you don't want to read bullet points during your presentation, but we'll cover that in a bit. The reason I will be reading bullet points is that I'll be driving an entire day in a workshop uh, using uh, the, the slides only. And then I usually, we have those exercises and so on. Uh, again, you can you can go through the workshop that I'll give you there at the end. So what we're going to cover today is how you can select your subject, how you can research your subject and then compose what you want to say. And then I'll explain to you how you uh, pick the audience that you want to come. And then we'll talk a little bit about verbal skills and your confidence. And then we'll talk about delivery mechanics. And that has to do with how you manage your stage. And then we'll talk a little bit about dealing with difficulties uh, because we always have problems uh, in, a, in a presentation. That's just part of it. And so we will uh, we'll cover that as we as we sort of go forward here. OK, uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about is how to select your subject. Let's say you'd like to speak at a conference or you've spoken at lots of conferences uh, in, in your day and you're kind of dry on the material. You don't know what to talk about. And you wonder, do I have anything to say that anyone cares about? Well, well, you do. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to think about first. You've often been told that content, in other words, what's inside your presentation, is king or queen, if you will. And the answer is, that is not true. In fact, content is not king. Your most important point of your presentation is the point of your presentation. In other words, today we're going to be talking about technical presenting skills. So every single thing that we do within this session should point to that goal. I want you to be a better presenter. So everything I do inside this session should do that. If it doesn't, then you shouldn't have it in your deck. Don't talk about things that don't support the the topics. Uh, so how do you pick a topic? Well, there's various types. Uh, the first one we often use is features and benefits. This is point in time recovery. And the reason you do that is in case you have some sort of a problem in your database and you need to go back to a certain point. Uh, you could do a case study. And this starts out with something like once upon a time, I or once upon a time, this company did. So that's another way to think about phrasing what you want to talk about. You could also do modular. So uh, Ben and his session may talk about ARC data services and what it is, and how it works, and uh, when you would use it, and some of the things you need to think about. So he'll break that into modules, perhaps, for you to study. And then, of course, there's compare and contrast. Now, uh, you won't see me do a lot of these. I, I do some of these, but not a lot. This is often like um, Azure for the AWS professional or something like that. So I don't often talk about competitors. 
I wouldn't expect as a Microsoft person for you to um, believe anything I would say about a competitor. Uh, and I would hope you would feel the same way about them. However, you might say something like, hey, if you know how to use a relational database, here are some concepts inside the R programming language that are very similar. So I do those quite a bit. So you can start out, if you think I don't have anything to talk about, you can look at this list and immediately say, actually, I do have some things that I can talk about, and I can talk about them in this way. The next thing you need to think about, let me make sure that didn't skip over. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, hopefully, you're, I'm going to turn around a minute so you can see the screen. Never supposed to turn your back to the audience. Yes, okay, good. You're seeing what I'm seeing. I've got a little control feature here to my right. And I want to make sure what, what you are looking at is what I'm looking at. Uh, by the way, one of the things you can do as a presenter is always explain what's happening. Like, for instance, if your demonstration doesn't go well and uh, something runs by and it's not functioning correctly, don't just become silent. Uh, when I used to do radio, they taught us the worst thing you could ever have was something called dead air. And dead air means you're not saying anything. There's no commercial. There's no music. There's just nothing on. Our mind doesn't like dead air. So if you're ever having an issue, just think out loud. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Let me take a look. I'll open management studio. Oh, I see. I'm not connected to a database. Let me do that now. And so on. Right. All right. Uh, so first of all, you need to think about after you pick the style that you want to do, let's say you're going to do modular, that your headline sells. In other words, what you title your session that can be clever if you like, but it's more important that it says what the session is going to be. This is how you kind of select your audience a little bit. You explain what you're going to talk about and who you're going to talk about it to. The first part you need to think about when you're creating everything is what does it mean? What, is the, what does the headline mean? So mine's fairly obvious today. Uh, technical presentation skills. So that's exactly what it means. It means skills that you need to be an effective present, uh, presenter for technical topics. The next thing you need to think about is why is this important? And I think we all know why this is important. Uh, we've all sat through terrible presentations. And, and we don't want to waste our time. We, we don't have a lot of time in life, and it will soon be over. And so we want to spend it doing effective, efficient, productive things. And so uh, we want to make sure we explain why this is important. And when you're talking about your audience, you need to think about why should they care? Now, if you're a speaker today, if you're someone that does professional speaking or you want to do professional speaking, you should care always about being a better speaker. And you can always learn something new. The next thing you need to think about is why am I telling you this? Now, you'll recall from the top of the presentation, I said my name is Buck. And I've been doing and teaching presentations for many, many, many years and that sort of thing. So you need to sort of give them your credentials. And you may say, well, I'm not an expert. That is a credential. I had someone uh, who you know about 20 years ago approached me and she said, I want to do a presentation, but I don't think I have anything to say because I'm new in this area. And I said, you have the most to say. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, what do you find most difficult in what you want to talk about? She said, well, I can't figure out how to do X, Y, Z. I said, then talk about that. The reason I'm talking to you today is because I found it very difficult to figure out X, Y, Z. So here's what I did. There is always someone at your level. And we often believe that the audience is smarter than we are. In my case, that's always true. But in general, no one will come to your session unless they want to hear what you have to say. And so they're there on purpose. They want to be there. All right. Um, the next thing is, what will you learn? And in my abstract, you saw, I will explain to you the ways that you can improve your presentation skills by doing the following. And I have that in there. Now, the last part is probably the most important part that there is. This is called a CTA or a call to action. At the end of your presentation, you should have some sort of thing you want people to do. You should have something that, that you're trying to get them to, to change or do better or start doing or perhaps stop doing, like how not to write terrible queries, things like that. So you need to have the call to action. 
Whenever I've uh, critiqued speakers before, they'll ask me, can you critique? They do a fantastic job of informing everyone. And I'm like, that's great. What do you want me to do? And they they look at me like, well, I, I don't know what you mean. And I say, well, I mean, OK, you've given me all this cool stuff. You've shown me the menu at the restaurant and then you've asked me to leave. I don't ever get to order any food or pay for it. So that's a bad idea to do. All right. So you need to always include that call to action. Once again, um, uh, we don't normally read the, the slides like this. This is not normally the way you do presentations. We'll talk about slides, but this is a, a workshop. So we're, we're kind of mirroring that session. So the next part, you picked what you want to say, you know what you want people to do about it. You pick the style that you're going to follow, whether it's modular or a case study or whatever. And you've also decided, here's why people should listen to me. Here's who should come and so on. So now let's start researching everything we need to do and compose our first deck. Now what I do, and I'm not sure why, there we go. I'm going to go back. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, for some reason, it just had a blank screen in there between it. All right. Go with the flow. Uh, and what the flow means is this. You need to go from one point to another point to another point. Now, uh, if you think about trying to memorize your presentation or read it, that just becomes very difficult. It's better to think about the one or two or three or five things that you're going to cover within the time you're working. And when you do that, now you'll be able to uh, flow from one point to another. I call this waypoints, not turn by turn directions, right? I don't read a map. I just say, OK, I need to go west until I'm roughly here and then go east until I'm roughly there and so on. This is what we do in our presentations. That way, if you forget and you're like, where was I? What was I doing? You just think about the next waypoint and you'll get right back on track. They have three different general kinds of, of flows you could do. The first is process oriented. And what I mean by that is Ben might say something to us like when he's talking about ARC data services, uh, here's how you install it. Here's how you configure it. And here's how you uh, program it or use it. That might be the, the flow he uses. Or perhaps he'll use something chronological, which is first we bring in the data and then we do some data cleansing, and then we do some data reporting, and so on, and it's a chronological. Or chronological might work well for things like backups, or maintenance, or performance tuning. Those are all time-based or temporal. You could also do problem solution. Well, I couldn't figure out why my system was so slow, and so I did the following things to research it. So that's problem and solution. I do quite a few of the latter and the first one, which is process. Um, sometimes chronological makes sense. Uh, I do a session called a day in the life of the data scientist. And I take the tasks that a data scientist does throughout a month and I collapse that into a single day. And people really enjoy that because they can visualize where they are within your presentation. So these are the flow options that you have. Now I'm watching the, the chat window. Here we go. Um, we've got, uh, we could use voice, okay. And so uh, we've got just the comment from Ben as if he has attended my session before. No, Ben, I don't ever attend any of your sessions. Okay, uh, one of the things that, that you might also think about is um, that everyone loves a story. It, it's very interesting. And in fact, in the workshop, we spend quite a bit of time on this. And so what I want you to take away from this slide is you should always have a story in your session. And you think, wait a minute, how, <laughs> how, do, how in the world do I make a story out of a backup? Well, it's very easy to create a story. All stories have just very simple elements, and they go back to the dawning of language we tell stories. Uh, the first is there's characters, which is just the people involved. And you can call out to those characters as, as we go through here. I'll, I'll give you an example in a moment. There's also a setting. There's somewhere. These characters are in a place or places. And then they're in some kind of situation. So you can think about the situation that they're in. And every story has a beginning 
where you start off and you introduce all your characters and the setting and the situation. You have the development, which is the middle of the uh, things that are occurring. And then it has an end where you fix everything or you close everything out or you blow something up if you're in the Avengers or, or whatever it happens to be. And it's important to have conflict. Uh, conflict is actually part of every story. And, and so let's take an example of this. Let's take something we mentioned a moment ago about backups. How in the world could we make a story out of backups? Well, it's actually quite easy to do that. Here's how you do this, right? Let's Let's do a story. So you say... There was this one time when I was working at a healthcare company, right? So I've already started with the there was this one time, and your mind instantly goes to a specific point. You're following along with me. You're walking behind me as I go to work. And I've told you that I'm working at a healthcare facility. Perhaps you've done that. You've worked at a hospital or a medical billing unit or something like that. So you've done this. So your mind is instantly thinking about that lady that takes care of the billing and that guy that was working on the printer that day and all these sorts of things is what you're thinking of in your head. You're already in an imaginary story just with that. Then we give the setting. I sat down. I got my first cup of coffee because every good database administrator knows you get your coffee first. Because if you don't get your coffee first and you open your email, you're done. You'll never get up. You'll never get your coffee. Everyone laughs. I can't hear you laughing, but I'm sure you're doing that right now. You wait for laughter, right? And so, uh, you know, I got my coffee first. I cut the computer on and instantly I had an email. I had a notification on my system that the backups failed. And there's my conflict, right? That's my situation. So I have my character, which is me and the people in the office. And it's implied that there's the IT manager and she's going to ask me why, why I haven't checked the backups lately. Um, did something fail? Like, do I need the backups? I'm instantly, I've got conflict. I've got tension. I'm nervous because of what's happening. So you guys want me to resolve this. You want me to tell you what happened. Was it just a bad report? Was did the backups fail? Why did they fail? And so on. You want to know. You need me to resolve this. And I say to you, OK, I took a deep breath and I took out my checklist because I have a process. So now, you know, the session that we're going to do is about how you handle recovery uh, from a failed backup and what to do and what to check. So now I'm going to give you either problem solution or I'm going to give you chronological or I'm going to give you a process flow. And I begin to tell you what I did. I checked this and I did that. Now, here's how you do that. Here's some Transact SQL code. Here's the uh, tool I use for monitoring. Here's the Azure panel I looked in or whatever it happened to be. That's the middle where I'm developing what I'm doing. And then, of course, by the end, I say, and that is how I found out that I had run out of space uh, on the backup media, and I knew from then on what I needed to do and what I want you to do is set up some preemptive monitoring to make sure you never run out of space on your backup media, right? And there's my call to action. Hopefully, uh, you're seeing that, that that is how you handle. Let's see if I can drag this. Okay, good. I can see the... Um, I can see the chat window better now. So if you do have questions as we're going along, I can see that a little better. Uh, but this is how we developed a story about backups. And you were with me all the way. You want to know, did the guy fix the printer? Uh, is the lady that's working on billing, does she know? Did you have a problem? Uh, what did you do to fix it? How does that work? Can you do it in the future? Did you get a promotion? Did your boss find out? Uh, how did you handle this, right? So that's how you make a story. Everything should have a story. Now, it doesn't have to be a big story. The whole thing doesn't have to be a story. But if you're not going to do an overarching story throughout your presentation, what you should do is sprinkle stories in. Lots. These are called anecdotes. Anecdotes. And an anecdote is a short story, like one or two minutes, that illustrates your point that you're making. So an anecdote usually starts out with one time I or one time they or one time it, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Hopefully you're you're uh, you're following along there. All right.
Okay, now let's talk about the demo dilemma. Oh my gosh, uh, the demo dilemma. If I could point out one thing I see in technical presentations that pushes me over the edge it is, is a few things. First of all, uh, and by the way, do you even demo something? So I'm demoing by presenting today, uh, but in fact, um, do, do I need to show you things? And the answer is yes. You always want to demo something. People rarely want you to talk about backups and never show a screen, never show any code, much less the code running. First of all, demo the point only. Uh, this is especially interesting inside the data science world where I live. Uh, data scientists absolutely love to come up with very convoluted, difficult problems so they can show me the one training algorithm that works well on vision algorithms, let's say. And, and I'm like, you know, I really don't care about the fact that you're trying to identify the numbers on the back of a passing train in the Netherlands uh, at two in the morning when you're going between these two particular cities. That's not important. <laughs> so demo just the point. You want to thin that down. And there are there's several reasons to do this. Uh, the first reason is you can control the time much better if you only demo the point. If I'm going to show you a backup, I do not need to show you 50 examples of the backup in a single statement. I can just show you the one that we care about at the moment. So that's the first part. Second thing is um, you'll have far less errors if you uh, keep a boundary around what you're going to demonstrate. You don't need to demonstrate everything. It'll save you a lot of problems going forward. And the most important point about keeping your demos very restricted to just the point is that it's more understandable. You are presenting to explain something to someone. If they don't understand when you're done, you have failed. No matter how good everything else was, it's the audience that matters. Remember what the king is or the queen. The point is the king or queen. That's the most important part, not uh, how clever you can be inside a demo. Second thing, make sure your demos are visible. Large font. Uh, set your environment up. We'll call this out a, a little bit later. That's another reason to keep your demos very short is that uh, the code is much more, more visible that way. Uh, next, you need to practice your demo a great deal and you need to have backups. Now, what I do uh, for backups is I have screenshots that I just walk through. And here's why. Uh, I've had people say, well, I don't want that. I want you to type. Never type in a demo. Just don't type in a demo. No one cares that you're a good typist. There's a chance that you'll make a mistake, that you'll make an error, and that's just embarrassing, and it will throw you off as you're presenting. Remember, you're presenting. You're not trying to interview for a job. You just want to, and, and not only that, I don't need to know that you can type. I just want to see the code. Highlight the code and explain it to me, but don't type it. Just paste it or use a template or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you also, also want to practice so it's perfect every time. But even better, and what I'm doing a lot more of now, is I just make a, a, a recording of the screen, no sound, nice and slow, and I click the play button. And of course, people say, well, wait a minute, aren't you worried that people think that you're uh, making it up, that it's vaporware that it doesn't No, I have never had one single complaint about hitting play on a video and then facing the audience. And as I go through the video very slowly on, on the video with no sound, I'm explaining it from the stage. Now you can see we type this and we click here and so on. Then feel free to type in a demo because you're recording it and you can get it perfect every time and you can share it. And you can tell people, hey, if you want to download that video to see the steps, here it is. There's just no loss to recording your demo. So if anyone says, um, you know, you should never record your demo, you send them to me and I can prove uh, that it's always a good idea to do that. Even if you do the video, however, make sure you have a backup. And, and I always will talk about this in dealing with disasters. I always have three kinds of backups and we'll see what those are in just a moment. So that's the demo dilemma.
Uh, next, let's talk about how you select your audience. So let me check the, okay, good. I'm just checking the comments. They disappear on me uh, when I begin speaking. So I just want to make sure I, I keep my eye on those. So how in the world do you pick your audience? Like you, you all just walked in here. There was nobody at the door going, you can't come in here uh, because Buck doesn't want you here. There, there's actually a couple of ways you can do it. The first is, is in your title. We talked about the er, we talked about this earlier. Um, what does your audience know? In your abstract, you're going to say something. So you normally have a title, you know, technical professional presentation skills, and then underneath that, there's going to be a, a little abstract that says some things. And a lot of times, you don't know how to make those abstracts. Well, here you go. Here's the formula for making abstracts. If you want to, you can take a print screen uh, here to keep these notes. Uh, again, I'll give you all these materials. Uh, first, uh, what does your audience know? So in mine, I'll say if you're a technical professional that needs to learn how to do better presentations, well, there you go. That's who's going to show up. And if somebody shows up that doesn't do that, then it won't make any sense if they complain because you said right up front, this is who should come. Second, what do they need to know? If you would like to improve your speaking skills, what will you tell them? I will explain a process, a procedure, a flow for developing your content. What will they learn how to do, need to do, want to do? This is your call to action. At the end of this session, you'll be a better presenter. That's your call to action. Today, that's your call to action. If you put these tips, even a few of them, into play, you'll be a better presenter. Will you be perfect? Well, no, uh, nobody's perfect. I mean, except for Ben. But everyone else needs to improve uh, their public speaking. So make sure in your uh, abstract, when you're talking, that you make you you call each of these out. You can even use this as a little formula to develop your abstracts, and you'll make much better abstracts. And you will pick the audience that actually shows up. Uh, next thing you need to do when you're picking your audience is to involve your audience. Make sure you ask questions, and, and it's harder to do this in real life. Um, for those of you in the audience, I'd like you to press the function key, FN, unless you're on a Mac. I have no idea how the, the toy computers work. I just work on a real one. Um, hold down your function key and press F1. Everybody do that for me real quick. Does that work when everybody does it? No. Oh, there's there you go. A function F1. Function F1. Okay, good. Oh, there you go. See, look at that. Function F1. Ta-da! Uh, function F7. Everybody press function F7. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Gungam style. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So in every session you're doing, including this one, make sure you involve your audience. Ask them questions. How many of you have had a problem uh, where you had XYZ happen and the audience raises their hand or whatever it happens to be? Um, urge the interaction. Don't be afraid. Now, you'll notice at the very beginning, one of the things I did was I set the expectation for how you interact with me. I said you can use the chat window or you could raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. And then the moderator will turn your microphone on and so on. Explain to your audience how they interact with you. If you just get on stage and ramble on in a monotone voice that never changes up or down, uh, people will become very tired of listening to you pretty quickly. <laughs> so it won't it won't go well for you. So I urge you to uh, let people know how they interact with you and then to interact. And then encourage active listening. Let's talk about that for a moment. You can search on the web for the word active listening. And what active listening means is that you're not just letting the words come in and go out the other side of your head. You're, you're taking some time to process each thought and you're developing questions, even if you don't ask them. You would develop questions in your mind around every single concept the person is telling you. And the other part of active listening is taking notes. Now, this is kind of interesting. When you're working with notes, and I'm talking about paper and pencil notes, not a computer, paper and pencil notes, and I'll tell you why. 
Uh, paper and pencil notes make you use the part of your brain that does spatial or space reasoning. And what that means is when you draw, and in fact, when you write letters, when you write down letters of your alphabet, you are drawing. You're an artist. You've learned to draw at least one thing, and that's the letters of your alphabet that you form into words. When you write those down, when you put those things down, your brain is engaging on multiple places. It's not just using the language portion or the typing portion or anything else. It's actually using multiple parts uh, of your brain. So uh, encourage your audience to take notes uh, when you're talking. The other thing you do when you take notes is you're taking the words themselves and then you're reforming them into a thought you have. You're not just scribbling things down. You don't have time to write down everything the speaker says. You're doing something called chunking, chunking. And chunking is where you take a bunch of things and you put them together within a single thing. So, for instance, if I were to say sandwich, uh, you would know that that involves bread, uh, some vegetables, and possibly some meat. And maybe a condiment like mustard or, or something like that and another piece of bread. But I can say the word sandwich and you know that that's one single unit that PK unzips into more units. And so when we write notes, we're chunking and your brain's having to come at it from different directions. So when you do that and you involve your audience, uh, they're going to do a whole lot more of this. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to our next topic here, which is how do we do the delivery itself? Most of the time when I teach public speaking, this is what people focus on. They actually focus on how do I do the public speaking? Like literally, how do I say things? How do I click on things? And, and so on. In fact, if you don't have a good topic, if you don't know what you're trying to say, if you don't involve the audience, if you don't have stories to engage people, the mechanics themselves uh, will do nothing for you. So you, you, you need the rest. The mechanics are just part of it. So let's take a look at a few of those mechanics here. Let's talk, first of all, about PowerPoint. Um, everyone I know that hates PowerPoint has never once learned to use PowerPoint. Not once. I asked them, well, what training have you taken? Uh, how many times have you hit the F1 key and taken any of the, the training that's built in? PowerPoint now even has a presenter coach, uh, and you can look that up if you wish, presenter coach. And if you add that into the PowerPoint, you can take your laptop, start your presentation, walk back from your laptop, and give the presentation out loud to the laptop, and it will critique you. It will tell you how you're doing. It will give you suggestions on how to be better. It does all this with artificial intelligence. So yes, even PowerPoint has AI in it. Uh, so definitely make use of those features. Now, the first part I'm going to tell you is something that people don't often get. Uh, you only use graphics, the little icons or whatever, for state. In other words, the way something is and for movement the way something will be. So I can take a picture of a database, let's say the little can icon, and then I can turn it red. That's an animation showing that it's having a bad day. And then I can animate it out, meaning that the database has failed. I can then animate in uh, a picture of a tape, which could um, perhaps illustrate my backups wherever they may be, whatever medium I've used. And then I could show the tape morphing into the can of the database and it being green. So those are the only acceptable graphics. If you've got pretty graphics all over the place, then you're wasting your time. Now, there's one exception. If you're doing a keynote or you're doing something for entertainment, uh, it's OK to have silly graphics and to have pictures of your dogs and, and so on. That's all fine. But if you're in a technical presentation, I don't know about you, but I can't stand it when people have what looks like a ransom note uh, of fonts and, and so on. There's there's no point to that. You should only have two fonts in your entire presentation, just two. And a single font is fine and use bolds and underlines and italics, if you wish, to make it more interesting. Remember that the fewer slides you have, 
the better. Now, I've got quite a few today, but again, this is meant to take up eight hours. And between each one of these, by the way, in the full class IT, uh, we actually do exercises. So people touch the keyboard and, and do things in front of the room, and we have some dramatic things that we do, and uh, we have some improv things we do. It's a lot of fun. Make your fonts bigger. If you've got white space on your screen, use it. Here's the trick that you can use to make sure that your uh, slides are readable. Take a standard laptop anywhere from 15 to 17 inches uh, or 13 inches is fine too. Uh, bring up your PowerPoint, put it on a chair or table and walk 10 feet away, 10 feet or 10 steps back. Then navigate through your slides. If you can't read them, then in a large room, neither can anyone else. And you think to yourself, well, that, wait a minute, that, that can't be right. It is right. Uh, you can't see it. I don't know how many times I've gone in. I have to yell at Microsoft speakers all the time. Make your fonts bigger. Make the text bigger. Zoom in. Use control Windows Plus uh, or Windows Plus rather. It, there's a built-in Zoom feature in every operating system, even Linux has a built-in Zoomer. So Zoom, you use Zoom it or whatever you want to use, but make sure you Zoom in. Let's go back to that simple or fewer is better as well. Not only do you want to have large fonts in your screen that are visible, you don't need 38 slides. If, if, there, if you've got 38 slides, you're making a book, you're depending on the audience to read your slides and not listen to you. You want their attention to be on you, not on the slides, okay? If you have not learned inside PowerPoint to use the presenter view, if you've never played with that, that's the first training you should take. The presenter view is absolutely gold. You should absolutely use that. It's got your timer on there. It'll help you with time management. It's got notes feature. It shows you what's coming up next. You can arrange the screen and so on. So if you've never used the presenter view, use the presenter view. Um, print out your notes. I know this sounds a little weird, but I actually these days what I do is I have a little Kindle uh, on, on the stage with me and I have printed out my notes from the presentation view uh, and I've printed just the note parts onto a PDF. And you can actually print if you've never used the notes view inside PowerPoint. You should definitely take a look at that. You can make notes yourself and then you can print them and it puts the picture of the slide and what you want to say together and you can print that to a pdf and then have that on stage and this will come into play later and if your uh, system that you're presenting with can only show one monitor at a time you'll still have your notes available so that's a tip for you there um, or, and also, by the way, uh, make a GitHub and you'll see at the end of this, I'm going to give you a GitHub site with all my notes and all the references and all the URLs and all of the things I said and even the PowerPoint deck. And I'll just give you that link when we're done and everything's there because everybody's like, oh, can you go back? I want to take a picture of the screen or whatever. I just tell them I'm going to give you a GitHub with all that. Use the Zoom key. Uh, Windows Plus is very useful and there are multiple modes once again. If you've never learned how to use it, just go research. I use the Windows Zoom, two minutes of learning, and you'll be much better to your audience. And it's just Windows Escape to get out. Now, I'm not going to do that here because of the platform we're on, but we know we need to adapt uh, sort of to that. Finally, um, always use dark on light like I'm doing here. Now, you will hear people say, oh, no, no, I always use dark mode when I code. Well, you're just too cool for school, and that's awesome. Good for you, but I can't see it. The human eye sees dark colors on a white background far better. Uh, there are all kinds of studies on this. It's called contrast polarity and visual acuity, uh, and it, it helps you to see when there's something dark on the light. It goes all the way back to a tiger trying to get the caveman uh, or cavewoman uh, coming over the horizon against the sun. So it goes that far back. So if it's good enough for the cave person, it's good enough for your presentation. Let me see if we got any comments here. Use Zoom it. Size 32.2 is minimum, it says, uh, which is uh, all good, all good points. Okay, we'll keep going here. Session management. So we talked about how to get how you get your PowerPoint ready. 
by the way, I try to have uh, not this one because, again, this is a class, but I try to have eight slides and that's it. Just eight. If you can't get your point across in eight slides in 50 minutes, you're doing something wrong. All right. First of all, get there early. Do not show up one minute before your session starts. That's a rookie move. That's not a good idea. Second thing is if anybody asks a question during your presentation, this is especially uh, important when you don't use a chat feature. And by the way, I've used a chat feature on stage. I've had people while I'm presenting go ahead and I watch a chat window on stage so they can just type in their question and we don't have to stop and hear voice. But if you do have to stop and hear voice, repeat the question. Here's why you do that. By repeating the question, you get time to think about your answer. You make sure that everyone else heard what was going on. Let me try this with you. Here we go. Uh, so Ben has raised his hand and he's mumbled something and then I stand there. OK, and here's what what I hear and what you hear in the audience. Hi, Buck. I was just wondering, uh, whenever you do your backups, do you keep them on site or do you keep them off site? Because we always keep ours on site. And then I reply to Ben, that's a terrible idea. Never do that. Now let's play that back during the recording. Yes, Ben, you have a question? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, never do that. That's a terrible idea. Do you, do you see the point here? <laughs> now everyone on the recording is like, wait, don't do what? What's a terrible idea? So always, always, always repeat the question. Uh, go as slow as you can. If you need to rush to get your presentation done, you have too much material. That should be another presentation. Cut it down. Take your time. Now you should be enthusiastic. You should be happy to be on stage. Now, I'm not asking you to be as enthusiastic as an American. That's just crazy. Uh, no one should be that enthusiastic. Uh, but you should at least be happy that you're at some place. At my age, I'm happy to be anywhere. So it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive there. When your time is done, get off the stage. When your time is done, get off the stage. No speaker likes it to have to rush the other person. So here's what I would say if we were in person. Hey, when we're done today, I'm going to step out in the hall and I'm happy to take any of your questions, but I want to be very respectful of the speaker that follows. If you have an hour's worth of content for an hour session, it's too much. You need to have about 50 minutes. Better if it's 45 minutes because it always takes longer than you think. So get off the stage. Okay, that's our next session of management there. Let's talk about our verbal skills and confidence for just a moment. Pacing and timing. Your practice will help you pace so that you don't rush or go too throw, slow through your presentation. We talked about earlier that everything you're doing should lead to the point. If it doesn't, you can cut that out and make it slower. Every slide you do, not this one. Again, this is a class. But when you're doing things, every episode, if you watch television, just before the commercial, there's like this huge cliffhanger. What's going to happen? Uh, Diane's leaving John? What's John going to do? And so on. And if you have something that needs to be discussed in more depth, just point to a URL of a blog you've written. I blog all my questions is the way I do it. So that's how I handle timing. To do that properly, we need to practice. This will give you your time checks and show you where you need to be at a certain point, and it'll help erase the ums and the ahs as you're trying to talk. This will also help you to know what you want to say. You won't have to figure out on the fly, here's what I should be talking about. And remember, as I said earlier, if you've got three or four main points, that's better than trying to memorize every part of your slide. Now let's talk about dealing with difficulty. There is always difficulty. Something will go wrong. In my 40 plus years of speaking, I've had everything go wrong, including somebody taking their shirt off, a female, in the middle of the session. That has happened to me. And if you're not ready to deal with that, uh, that can be very uh, interesting. All right. Um, second thing you need to know about this is the technology. We'll start out, you need three presentations ready at all times. A high tech, a low tech, and a no tech. High tech is everything's working. Slides work, demos work, computer works, room works, lights work, everything. Low tech is something doesn't work. Now I've had projectors go out and what I normally do is just have people pop up their laptops 
I start a quick uh, Zoom meeting or Teams or whatever they have, and I just present over that from the stage. So there's always a way to, to get that through. And then no tech is what would you do if nothing's working? Would you still have anything to say? And if you will prepare your no tech, that will help you the most with your high tech, with everything working. Those are some of the things that can go wrong. The second part of or third part of the things that can go wrong are people. There are some people who have an honest question. They've been dying for 12 months to ask you a certain question that has absolutely nothing to do with the topic at hand. So you should acknowledge that. Hey, I hear that question. I understand what you're asking me. Not really what we're covering here, but I'll join you in the hall just after this presentation, and maybe we can talk a little bit further about how that works. The second thing they could just have is a lack of clarity. They could be getting lost, and they've got an honest question where they're like, okay, I don't understand what's happening. Make sure you're able to go back far enough to get them back on track. If you can't, then say, join me in the hall and I'll bring you up to speed. They might be angry. I've seen people that just have a, a problem and they just, they either have a problem with you or your company or a software, or maybe they argued with their significant other. Who knows? They've got, a, uh, they're just frustrated. And what you can do is acknowledge that feeling. Hey, I know you're I know you're frustrated right now. I get it. I understand you paid too much for Windows 10. I get that. I wish I could change that for you. I can't right now, but I'm happy to chat with you later. I'd love to get through this material if you don't mind. Sometimes, though, they just need a stage. Somebody starts talking and they get in love with their own voice and they're asking a question and it's going on way too long. And so what you do there is let them chat for a moment. And then when you see this is going to be quite the story, you stop them and say, just so I'm clear, I think you're asking this. And if not, let's cover this at another time. But here's what I think you're asking. And then answer whatever question you wanted to ask uh, or you wanted them to ask to begin with. If you don't know what it is, just make something up that you know the answer to. And there all are people that just sort of need a stage. <laughs> no matter what you do, always repeat the question. Always repeat the question. Now, again, we've got a little chat window here so you can all see the, the chat here. Uh, and we can all see the question, which is wonderful because that way we get away from language barriers or any other problems. Uh, and uh, always repeat it. All right. So uh, we're going to end today uh, about two minutes early. Uh, but I did want to leave time for questions, number one. And number two, to give you this little URL here, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash BW, that's Buck Woody dash presentations. And these are several of my presentations, not just this workshop, but you'll see there a speaker's workshop, which has the full deck uh, with the, with the uh, exercises. Uh, if you go to that, make sure you look at the notes view because the notes view is where I put sort of everything else. Well, I appreciate your time today. And if this has been uh, useful to you or valuable, if you feel like you're a better speaker now, let's all press um, function F7 and uh, let's do Gangnam style together. Let's end it on a high note. Function F7. There we go. We got some people with the feeling. There we go. Nicely done. Nicely done. Okay. Oh, it does it even sitting down. And uh, there's people that have learned to uh, do that. Wow, it does it sitting down. That's impressive. Uh, and standing up. Oh, and somebody's got a cowboy hat on. Wow, that really brings it to life. Look at this. Got the whole room dancing. Okay, listen, everybody. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, for the next speaker, hopefully we're ready to go here. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to hit me up. Uh, here in the chat window. I don't see any more, but I'll hang out here in the chat window for just a few moments, and I'll turn my microphone um, microphone to mute. Uh, Tomas is, uh, is uh, typing some things, so he probably got some more direction for us, and we can go from there. How do you do that? People don't have questions. <laughs> There's one of three ways, Tomas. Uh, first of all, is the I was so good that there just aren't any questions. Uh, more likely, secondly, people quit listening a long time ago. Uh, and then the third way is they can't figure out how to use the chat. That's probably what it is. And we're all being funny here, obviously. Hopefully hopefully, uh, you do have some, some questions there or some thoughts you might have that you can share.
for me, I guess it was the one. Okay. <laughs> Very kind. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I know you've got a great conference ahead of you. Definitely go check out the other speakers that you have in the room here and enjoy the rest of Sequel Day.